uh, I, I think that I, more than anyone, took the initiative to ascertain, did we need such a program? And if so, what would be the shape of it? Um, Lederberg and I gave a course, just the two of us, which was primarily his course, but he asked me to help him with it. And we had no thought of having a major or a big program. We just wanted to give a course on the human organism. But we wondered how that would be related, particularly for undergraduates, how it would be related, if at all, to the experience of human beings, of, of themselves as persons. And uh, uh, I contacted a number of universities to see what they were doing, and in essence, to oversimplify, the medical schools said, well, we do teach distinctively human biology, at least to a certain extent, in the context of clinical medicine, but we do not teach undergraduates. On the other hand, in biology departments and other um, departments of humanities and sciences, the response, particularly in biology, typically was, we we're very excited about the new molecular and cellular biology, but we do not teach distinctively human biology. If that's to be taught here, it's to be taught by the, the medical school. We wanted, in a way, to have what you might call organismic biology, that is, what is distinctive about the human organism taken together. It's not a bag of molecules. Students from great universities should learn on a pretty broad scale about the different levels uh, of human organism. Uh, from the molecule to the society and um, and learn the relation of that to uh, health problems and to other social problems, for example, the resolution of environmental questions. Which... Dave Hamburg and I knew a guy at the Ford Foundation named Gordon Harrison, and uh, my recollection is that he and I shared weird common interests. One was in malaria, another was in uh, military history. Anyway, uh, in around 1970, uh, the big foundations discovered there was a thing called the environment, and I can remember talking uh, to Gordon about it and saying, look, uh, he, he wanted to give money, the foundations wanted to give money to help with the environment. And I said, this is not a situation where dumping money in is going to do a lot of good because you've got to train people first to be able to deal with these issues. We don't have, if every ecologist, uh, you know, if you had 10 times as much money, it couldn't be spent well. In some ways, Gordon Harrison was interested, but in the end, he hated the program. Uh, and I'll have to explain that a bit. He came out here and talked to me and to, uh, and to Dave, and I don't remember the sequence anymore, but um, uh, we came up with the idea of having a human biology. The real driving force behind it was a consultant, Lawrence Hinkle, professor of medicine at Cornell, was a very active, dynamic consultant at Ford, and he heard about what we were doing, and he and I were old friends, and he contacted me and asked me if I could get together in a month or two a group of faculty from different disciplines at Stanford who might be interested in teaching together to make something like a human biology program. And I said, why wait a month or two? I think we could do it next week. We knew and in general, liked each other. Many other schools have tried to imitate human biology and have been unsuccessful because they had to find it difficult to get large numbers of persons who could be friendly. That friendliness made a big difference. I should emphasize to you that there were a number of faculty friends at Stanford who were looking for a reason to collaborate. We were able to recruit some of the best people on campus, like Sandy Dornbush and uh, Don Kennedy, basically immediately. And the status of the people who started it made a big difference. Josh Lederberg had won the Nobel Prize in genetics and was head of genetics. Uh, Dave Hamburg was head of psychiatry. Uh, Al Hasdorf was head of uh, psychology. I was head of sociology. Uh, Don Kennedy was head of biology. Uh, as, and also from biology came uh, Paul Ehrlich. And I hope I haven't left anybody out. And uh, coming the next, first year when we started to teach was Colin Pittendrick, who was the dean of the graduate school at Princeton. And we were just about ready to go when Josh Letterberg, who was a man of great foresight and also very strong convictions, decided that if we wanted to have an, 
program of enduring value, we should have endowed chairs. Well, you know who I left out? Norm Kretschmer, the head of pediatrics, was another of the founders. Norm and I, and I'm glad I remembered him because he was a good friend, uh, Norm and I were given the task of dealing with the Ford Foundation representatives. Now, the policy of foundations at that time was essentially no endowed chairs, with very rare exceptions. But we made an effort with Ford, which was, I believe, the largest foundation at that time. And uh, the two of us met with the two of them, and they offered us a little over a million dollars, and I said, no chance at all that we'll accept. You've got to give us an endowment in addition to that. They said it's against the policy of the Ford Foundation to do that. We said if we don't get an endowment, when the five years is up, we'll collapse. We're not going to do all this work in order to collapse, so we'll say no to your money. And we left. And as we left, Norm, who was a big time researcher in bigger grants that I ever participated in, put his arm around me and said, Sandy, you're in the big leagues now. To come back to what I said about Harrison, his, virtually his whole budget on the staff of his section, whatever it was called, uh, it might have been called Health and Environment or something like that, was taken from him by the president, George Bundy, uh, for to provide endowed chairs for Stanford. And Gordon Harrison did not like that at all. So we waited, and in fact, what happened was they gave us $2.6 million. $1.6 million was for an endowment, which would pay for half the salary of four full professors. So the idea was that there would be endowment available to support faculty positions and an opportunity for the university and its faculty cre to create a new combination of disciplines. In those days, I can't say what everybody else was thinking about. I think uh, Don and I, at least, were thinking uh, very hard about uh, sort of changing the structure and focus of the university so it came, uh, was more effective at dealing with the, the clear problems of uh, uh, that way the natural sciences interact with the, what you might call the policy sciences. It was really before there was a substantial interest in universities in interdisciplinary programs of study. Uh, now, they're a key feature of the current campaign for Stanford. When you realize that departments were more or less invented by Aristotle and solidified by the British Royal Society in something like 1690, you understand why the structure of the university is basically insane from the point of view of education and the problems the world faces today. But Stanford is, in this area, still the very best university in the world. The others are more insane. The artificial divisions between what we call the disciplines, biology and psychology and anthropology, uh, that's not there in the subject matter. You take a human being, and a human being isn't psychological or biological or anthropological or sociological. Uh, it's a history, of, a history of the Western development or the Western sciences that these divisions were made. Uh, so in a sense, uh, I see the program as a major task or a major contribution of trying to bridge to overcome what are basically really artificial divisions. Now that is not to say that the program always succeeds in that because those are very difficult to overcome. Departments never especially cared for interdisciplinary programs. That meant they were sharing, quote, the wealth with another department. They were not, as because they were teaching human bio, maybe, you know, more than a course, they were not teaching something else in their departments. And these were some of the best teachers. And one of the reasons that this program got started and continued was the founders were all department heads. Had the founders not been these, like, pride of lions, or department chairmen, well-known people, the, the, the faculty senate may not have approved this program. I remember that we got Colin Pittendrick, who had been, who, who we had recruited. He had been dean of the graduate school at Princeton, and we got him, I think, uh, with the lure that uh, we were closer, actually, to his favorite trout fishing streams than, than Princeton was. And Colin was a guy that just immediately engulfed people. 
he gave a fascinating lecture on the, e on the ecology of bromeliads, the water that they trap, the mosquitoes that use them, the, the whole ecosystem, which, which I thought was, was really terrific. And it got, it got the students very excited. And the program began with the notion of a basic course on sort of evolution that Colin Pittenrig was going to teach. And before we know it, this small seminar thing, uh, Pitt was teaching to absolutely a whole auditorium full of students. He was just marvelous at it. And that made the thing big at the very start. It made those of us teaching in the core feel a little odd because I, we, we, we thought Pittendrick was a little bit more of a master of, of that kind of uh, lecture than, than some of us were, but, I, but uh, he, he, uh, he, set a great, he set a great standard for us. I have to confess, in the first days of human bio, I really think most people got up and did their thing. I mean, everybody has some favorite lectures, mm -hmm. and we all did our favorite lectures. And they, they, it's a little magical that they, they blended together as well as they did. It was a series of individual performances, and we were very careful to make sure that those performances, to some extent, dovetailed. But you were, we weren't forcing people to live up to some rigid curriculum. People taught more of what they knew best, cared about most, wanted to communicate. Great lesson for me was the immense value of team teaching when you are teaching with other people in a course, let's say one quarter of the human biology core. The part that Don Kennedy and I taught, the, he, he went first. He was from nine to 10 and I was from 10 to 11. So uh, Don was an absolutely marvelous lecturer. And so I went to those and I said, oh my God. Uh, you're lecturing after other faculty members and they're often in the audience and you're in the audience when they have lectured and there is some pretty constant feedback among the teachers who are doing uh, this kind of mixed uh, menu teaching. I would say one of the really sparkling parts of the start was without it being forced, but essentially being forced to listen to each other. Uh, and because uh, we were not listeners, so we were talkers. Al Hestorf is an absolutely brilliant lecturer. He starts off relaxed like everybody's favorite uncle. He tells little tales, he's funny, and all the time he's moving towards making a major point that the students are never going to forget. Which is fabulous if you're a student, but I had to lecture immediately after Al Hastor. Surely, gosh, when we began this thing, surely just barely finished graduate school, I think, surely. I always thought of her as very young, but now I'm shocked to see that she's retired. And I tend to be a fairly traditional straight lecturer, enthusiastic, with lots of material I want to share, but I don't tell such cutesy tales. And yet coming after Al Hastoff, it was a real problem. And we tried to communicate to the students how these things link together. Some of the people who were more associated with the program, like myself, who were just always available, would be the ones who would do those bridging lectures or those attempts to show how, how things worked. There was a certain openness that was totally refreshing um, about the faculty at the, in the earliest years. I would like to think that on one of those occasions I suddenly said, well, here's how, I, how far I got. Can anybody else figure, help me figure out where I was going? I don't 
know that I did that. I want to believe that I did something like that. Because we were all very much aware that we were well schooled in our own disciplines and knew really very little about other disciplines, it became the norm to sit in on each other's lectures. When we, when we taught this course, we all sat in on everybody else's lecture, but it got to be a potlatch. That is, uh, we put so much effort into it. Uh, if, uh, for instance, we started lecturing without notes. And that became so time intensive uh, that we had, to, we had to quit. But it was fun while we were doing it. We paid much more attention to students in, on committees with faculty, to student advisors, to course assistants who worked with faculty, so that students really felt that they had a stake in the program and how it ran. Now, at Stanford, most departments do a fine job of teaching their undergraduate students. Still, uh, from their perspective, undergraduates are only a small part of their mission. A much larger part is dealing with graduate students in research. Sometimes I think my department, when I arrived here, tried to make believe undergraduates didn't exist. <laughs> In contrast, in human biology, um, the uh, raison d'etre was in fact to provide a quality undergraduate education. Every course was evaluated by every student, at least we tried to get every student to evaluate it, and at least four faculty members would read every evaluation. To the best of my knowledge, we were the first in the university to evaluate all our offerings by faculty. At the time, we were the pioneers here. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't evaluations in places, but we made this a condition of every course. And by having four faculty members read them, not just the person who gave the course, that meant that there was a lot of diffusion of information about what was working, what was not working. There was a committee that looked at the quality of student evaluations and where faculty members did not receive good teaching evaluations, we put additional resources at their disposal to get them to try to improve their teacher ratings. And if that didn't succeed, then we recognised that they were not the right person for this program even though they may have been an extremely eminent researcher. I, for example, was given the pleasant task of saying to our Nobel laureate, Josh Lederberg, don't you think you'd rather teach seminars? We had a Nobel laureate and he gave such lousy lectures, we fired him. We wouldn't let him teach in the course anymore. Most of the time, we see what the students say. We know why they said that. We have ideas as to what could be done, whether this it could be, should be changed or the orientation change or it's a too high or too low a level, all sorts of uh, ways in which uh, an evolutionary process takes place and is constant feedback. We had a sense that we were trailblazers, that this was new, it was exciting, no one had ever tried to do what we were doing, certainly not within a uh, first class, a world class university. So we very much were aware that we could define this as we wanted to, but it had to be academically rigorous and it really had to differentiate itself from other departments. So that was our challenge. We had a terrible problem and that was the core courses were wonderful. But then the students knew a little bit about a lot of things and it was very hard to ever feel that they were competent in anything. And Colin Pittendrick, who came from Princeton to Stanford, was the one who came up with the ideal solution, which was that every student would have to develop his or her own, if you will, major. One of the pieces of wisdom that the founders had was to have this core course to give them a real breadth and then require the students to shape their upper division lives and really work with an advisor to design a curriculum that would bring them into sharper focus with some topic. And we would provide counseling and they could take courses within our program, outside our program, the best that the university as a whole had that was available to go in the direction the student wanted to go. Typically, there are two, three types of students who major in human bio. First of all, and this we all know, are students who have interests that were very specific, but they don't fit uh, within the confines of a particular department. So they don't want to major in biology or psychology. And human bio makes it possible for them 
to kind of customize their education. And so since I advise all of these neuroscience students, I see how even with that kind of stricture of saying we're going to get now some depth in neuroscience, there are now so many ways in which that can be achieved, either at, with MRI studies or with, you know, down at the synapse level. So there's a whole range of ways that they can go forward and they have to really think about how this is going to happen. Second are pre-meds who want to go to medical school, have to fulfill the pre-medical requirements, but don't want to major in biology, which is sort of one of the common ways. And so they major in human biology, which accomplishes the same purpose. And I think this is, uh, there is data to show that the chances of getting admitted into medical school if you are a human bio major is no less or more, <coughs> at least not less than being a biology major. Biology found it infuriating that a higher proportion of human bio students were accepted by medical schools than of biology undergraduate students, but there's nothing they could do about it. Heck, this was a better introduction to to medicine than a lot of medicine courses. Now then there is a substantial group, I can't really put numbers on this, a substantial group who come to human bio because they don't know what they want to do. And I think that has made, the, I think the students in entering it agreed to a contract that they were going to play an active role in planning their own education. But they don't want to sort of rush into a, a, an educational path simply because that's what everybody else is doing. Or because you really need to be in a defined, you have to declare an interest in this or that. So if you are a student who either is unclear about what he or she wants, or he or she wants so many things that there has to be a certain weeding process, then human bio provides a very nice home for them. Human bio's existence provided these people that wanted that sort of different experience with some social support. Rather than being the only guy to doing, trying to combine physics and psychology or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you usually had some other people in human bio that did that so you were not alone. And I think that contributed a lot to this, that they, they supported each other in this venture. Now, there is another element here, which is also very important. Parents. Parents are very concerned about what their kids are going to do. They, most parents send their children to Stanford and pay this enormous sums of money so that they end up with a good job a good career beyond the job. You know, their children come home for Thanksgiving in the sophomore year and they say, well, dear, have you decided what you're going to major in yet? Yes, I'm going to major in Humbio. It's really cool. We do all this thing, these interesting things about like lactose intolerance and uh, so forth and so on. And uh, parents would say, well, what do you do with a degree in human biology? So if a student tells his, her parents, I'm majoring in biology or psychology or something else, the parents at least know what that is. They may be happy or unhappy about the fact that their child is majoring in philosophy, but they at least know what it is. If they say, I'm majoring in human biology, the parents have no idea because this is not a field like these other fields. Many of the parents of our first uh, graduating classes said to their children, what do you mean you're majoring in human biology? What kind of jobs can you get? This is not the right major for you. You're going to need a major that leads you somewhere, somehow, to a career. I've never forgotten when Mert Burnfield, who was one of the heads of the program later, said to the parents and students at, on graduation day, whatever your student has said to you as parents about what human biology is, is correct. Parents weekends and so forth, a, a parent would just subtly ask me, well, what, what do you do with a degree in human biology? My answer always was, anything you want. <laughs> There's a lot of nervousness, particularly if parents sense that their kids are kind of a little bit unclear about where they are going to go. So now they are going into a department that declaring a major, which itself seems to be unclear of what is this all about. But that's, is, that is where you know, they need to learn that 
this is not only a, this is not a waste of time, but a very useful period. So they have to write an essay about why they're doing what they're doing, and so they have to conceptualize what they think they want to get from each of these classes. And I argued as the director that we ought to give them back this essay when they graduated, or maybe go all the way back and give them their aspirations as a freshman, and then their essay as a, a sophomore, and then see what their transcript looked like and what they actually did. And of course now, they all keep all these things on their computer so they can come to you at graduation said, and say, well, I thought it was gonna be an X, but I know I'm a Y. By the time they graduated from Stanford, and having had this opportunity in human bio for a couple of years to find their bearings, they all did. Very few of them, 10 years later, were still at sea about what they wanted to do. So I think this is a, I'm not sure how, I mean, this is, we have written two books about this. I don't know who has read it. It's um, the book called The Cream of the Crop by Harant Kajadurin. And in that book, he really did the, the right experiment. He took a subset of the freshman class and he actually tracked them as freshmen, as seniors, and 10 years and then 20 years later. And what he discovered in short is that the students who came in and were questing and didn't know what they wanted to do, and even the ones who left questing 20 years later had a much happier existence, fewer divorces, a better kind of life, representation of their life, the ones who came in saying they wanted to be an ex and left being an ex were the ones who could only talk about their health club or the best restaurant they'd been to, but were really kind of boring and had stopped reading books 10 years before. This, this is clearly spelled out, and I think this is a very important function that uh, human bio, specifically in Stanford generally, allows people time to make sure that they are following a path which is exactly what they want to do. I was so excited to be working with young, really smart, very energetic, highly dedicated students who really wanted to change the world. I was uh, one of the original uh, teach-in people in, the, in White Plaza for the first Earth Day at Stanford. And they didn't know yet that they couldn't change the world, so they actually brought about more change than any of us thought was possible. But I thought this was a little bit crazy. I mean, here's an undergraduate proposing to the U.S. National Science Foundation to use taxpayers' money for a study, uh, a student studying other students. That may not be uh, commonly appreciated, that the amount of research done by undergraduates in human biology is really uh, impressive. I was overwhelmed by it uh, very early, even in that summer when I was planning it, and I realized that I would need the help of many other players. And the reason for that is that the program has quite a powerful set of institutions in place to encourage students to do research starting fairly early. Fortunately, Don Kennedy had invited me once to a planning session for Humbio which was uh, early in the planning stages, in which people were talking about how would Humbio be more hands-on and not just in libraries and laboratories. How would it really interface with the world? The purpose of a good interdisciplinary undergraduate program is to, is to give people some real occasions in which they can structure their own capacity to process their information to process their own beliefs to integrate it with their personal philosophy and their hopes for themselves and ultimately make better choices on the grounds of that of that fusion i could take this idea of mine that's way too big for me i could focus on a key part that i'm excited about which is air pollution and student health records but other students could work on the challenging questions of how do you do time lags. If today's pollution triggers a response three days from now, how are we going to find that in the data? And, and our students in human bio have always been prone to pick up on interesting challenges. People were working on um, many different aspects of um, some were studying the physiology. Well, how is it that ozone causes a perturbation in your throat, causes the irritation that you would lead you to the health center. Others were looking at, you know, what is it about um, who, who shows up at a health center and who says, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to go. What are, the, 
what are the barriers, uh, the motivational barriers? So we had all kinds of interesting related studies going on at the same time. And I, I learned early on how valuable all of that was, even though it wasn't going to affect necessarily my own findings. Um, but I realized how important the team was. And uh, so this was the first human biology workshop. I remember uh, before anybody uh, really heard about AIDS or heard about HIV, there was a, a student in Humbayo, I, I, I recall I think her name was Meg Thorburn, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, she was organizing a university-wide uh, conference on HIV-AIDS. For many years, starting in the 80s, I taught a class on, uh, on HIV. Uh, it was actually inspired by a student who put on a conference in 1986. She was right out there uh, uh, organizing speakers and people to be concerned about the issues and uh, predicting, you know, what... what was going to happen if, uh, as, a, as an epidemic developed. And the reason I'd say that that's sort of an, an iconic example of, uh, of human biology is because it looked at all the both medical, biological, social, demographic issues involved in this epidemic in, down to issues of behavior change and what the relationship between knowledge and behavior change is. One of my students, Johnny Dorsey, uh, came back from a summer in Africa and started an organization uh, called Face AIDS in which he was going to try to raise a uh, uh, million dollars to fund uh, issues of HIV in Africa. Uh, he basically set up a remarkable organization uh, that's spread across the entire country and he has, has uh, raised far more than their intended uh, target of a million dollars. I had one student undertake an honours uh, project where she was looking at orphanages um, in Tibet. Now uh, she looked at two samples, there is the Tibetans in Tibet and Tibet is under Chinese rule and as you know that's an issue of considerable political sensitivity but there are orphanages in Tibet. And then she had a group of Tibetan children in India uh, where many Tibetans fled when the Chinese really took over Tibet and there is a very large Tibetan community and they have established orphanages as well. She went both to Tibet and to this particular location in India and she assessed the children. She gave them drawing uh, activities to do and looked at the themes they developed. She spoke to their caregivers and looked at what their goals were. She looked at their, um, their cognitive advancement in the two different groups. So these were all ethnic Tibetans. They were in two very different political systems. There were some similarities in the structure of their orphanages and with quite different outcomes in the children. I thought that was an amazing piece of research for an undergraduate. She spent two summers collecting the data uh, and gave very insightful uh, interpretations of what she found. To the best of my knowledge, it was one of the first times that Tibetan children in Tibet had been compared to Tibetan children in India in a Tibetan community. One student was a woman um, of Japanese origin whose area of concentration was really studying the sociobiology of the internment camps. And she won a grant to go and look for something that her relatives had told her, which was that the U.S. government actually knew about tuberculosis in the internment camps, but had kept it quiet. And they required other members of the family to come take care of the people who had TB. And in that way, they actually caused the, the, the whole crisis in tuberculosis to spread in the internment camp. And she was in Washington, D.C., and I got a call from her that she had gotten in, inappropriately access to a, an archive where she found records showing that what she had heard from her relatives was true, and wrote this wonderful honors thesis in which she unveiled the duplicity of the U.S. government in treating these Japanese citizens in these really egregious ways. And, and she then turned that into a book and went on to medical school and has, has really been a wonderful example of how she could take a personal issue, which really you wouldn't think of as having an academic basis, and carry it through with real scholarship and discovery to um, a real 
tribute to her family as well as an intellectual exercise. And that really st struck me as one of the most wonderful things about the program. The thing that actually keeps me in teaching is uh, uh, the opportunity to work with the, the best and the brightest students you know, in the world at Stanford. Uh, and the, the fun thing about being here for a long time is I've not only gotten to work with them uh, as undergraduates, they've gone on to do amazing things. And so uh, I've gotten to watch their careers. <laughs> well, sometimes that's very humbling when you meet somebody in Safeway who says, I think I know you. And they say to me, were you at Stanford? I say, I was on the faculty. And Humbio, they'll ask, I'll say yes. And I'll say, oh, I remember you. You did an interview with an anorexic female. Now, that's very humbling because I maybe gave them 26 lectures where I prepared for months and worked my hardest to be scholarly and thoughtful and stimulating. And what do they remember? The one lecture where I simply interviewed a young woman when we were doing a unit on eating disorders. Human bio students are everywhere. Uh, Barbara and I went to uh, uh, visit New, England, New Zealand and in the Oakland Museum as we went up the steps there were some human bio students coming toward us saying, Sandy, what are you doing here? I've had, um, on a more positive vein, I've met students who years later have either written to me or met me at conferences and said, you changed my life. The course you, get, you taught me on adolescent development usually or on methodology has changed my life and I really wanted to tell you. About one out of four or five doctors <laughs> that, that take care of me or my sweetheart uh, were said, oh yes, I had you in human bio. I have never gone to an alumni club where somebody wouldn't come and say, you don't remember me, but I was in your class. And when the person saying this is like a pretty, you know, middle class, class middle aged person, my reaction is if you're in my class, I must be dead. One of the nice things about having been a teacher at Stanford is that what looked to me as middle aged people and some even elderly people come up to me and say, you know, I was in your population biology class in the human biology program back in 1973 or something like that. And they often say that what they learned in human biology changed their entire way of looking at the world, changed what, uh, changed what careers they went into, changed how many children they had. I just spent early afternoon with her and her little baby who came and visited me. Uh, works for a biotech company. I, I meet them all the time uh, in, in the world of health policy. I, I had a session yesterday afternoon with a couple of young women, one a venture capitalist working in the medical devices industry, one a venture capitalist working more generally in he with health. They're early 80s human bio graduates and very successful, but they're doing a lot of what we expected a number of students in human biology to wind up doing. One day I was walking down the street in Sausalito, across the bay, just walking down the sidewalk with family members, and all of a sudden I hear this voice from behind me yelling out, lactose! <laughs> and I turn around, and it's a home bio student I immediately recognized, and they knew it was me. And I think, honestly, they couldn't rec remember my name, but they remembered lactose. So they shouted out lactose, knowing they'd get my attention. And we had a nice, <laughs> a, 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 a nice remembrance there in the middle of the road in Sausalito. But uh, that happens a lot. So I've had 65 honor students, and about 40 have gone into academic work. The rest have gone into medical or MD-PhD programs. And some of them have been really dramatic. So one young woman was really committed to neurobiology and came and worked in the lab and really didn't suit her and so she said well I'm gonna go back to ballet and she then went on to be a ballerina in New York City after this so I consider that as much a success as not because she did an exper experiment on herself and said nope it's not for me the others many have done really interesting things that are are kind of outside the box so Kieran Soma who was the first undergraduate I had had, as we all do, parents with different ambitions than he had. And although he became really enchanted with neurobiology, there was resistance to him following this because of, for cultural and personal reasons. 
So he decided he would go and teach school in Ecuador for a year, which he did. He taught at a private school in Ecuador. And during this time became more convinced that he wanted to go into neuroscience. So he came back and worked in my lab for another year, published two really influential papers, and then went on to do a postdoctoral, I mean, a graduate work at University of Washington and postdoctoral work at UCLA, and now is a faculty member at the University of British Columbia. And I see him quite often at neuroscience meetings. Uh, where, I mean, I meet a woman who's at NIH, very, very active in, in, develop, in vaccine development, uh, her husband uh, is a, turns out to be a very good friend of, of my daughter's. We meet at a dinner party, and it turns out she announces she's a human biograph. Half the doctors my friends see in Washington, D.C. turn out to be human biology graduates. Deborah Zarin, who was who was uh, uh, one of my favorite course assistants, she and, she and her best friend uh, uh, both, both worked with me. She's, she's now at NIH. She's the director of clinicaltrials.gov. So it's just, it's just wonderful to see them just do, do these great things. So. The, the in inspiration I get about the program and the course and its history comes, a great deal of it comes from, from its graduates and seeing what they say about it and what, how they say it fit into their own personal ambitions and their, and their lives. Well, I had a very funny experience just this past week. Um, I was... Um, getting out of a taxi in front of my daughter's home where we live now and there was a young woman jogging with a Stanford uh, t-shirt and I said are you really from Stanford and she looked at my cap which is a Stanford cap protecting against the Washington Sun she said yes I'm really from Stanford and are you she said what class were you in well I wasn't a student but I was on the faculty there. Oh, what did you do on the faculty? I said, well, I was one of the founding fathers of something called the Human Biology Program. And she screamed. She said, my God, I was a human biology major. I've just graduated. I'm going to medical school at Vanderbilt next year. It's the greatest experience I've ever had, maybe the greatest experience I'll ever had. So with very intense and passionate um, appreciation of the program, it was as if we'd known each other for many years. Uh, both caring so much about this program, despite the disparity in our ages. Uh, I, w I would add to that that it's uh, not unusual for me to run into people, particularly when I was living in New York, um, who recognized me from the human biology course, who'd been, who'd been human biology majors and who now are working on Wall Street or doing something else. Many of them, of course, went into life sciences or into medicine or public health, but many didn't. And uh, uh, the reactions have been very similar to this one I described, not quite as intense, but what a powerful experience it was, how valuable, uh, entered into it with some skepticism, came out um, uh, with a kind of positive transformation. So, um, those experiences, of course, are very gratifying. I have no illusion that everybody came out that way, but a large proportion did.